Thanks very much, Pierce, for, for inviting me. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in today. My name is Daniele Gansel. I'm a historian, and I'm based in Switzerland. It's December 2023, and the snow has started to fall in Switzerland. And the uh, topic that I want to talk about today is uh, Ruthless Empire. I've written a book about uh, the United States. It's a critical book, as you can see from the title. And I want to maybe go back and uh, uh, look at, at at a moment where I met with people from from the peace movement in the United States. I think it's very important to understand that the peace movement is globally organized. It's usually small people, small people like me, or small people like David, or small people like Piers or Elizabeth. And when I say small people, I mean people who don't control armies or jets or aircraft carriers, but people who, who stand up for peace. And I met um, David Ray Griffin uh, in Switzerland in 2009. So that's an old picture of ours. Um, and I was, I was immediately struck by, by his honesty, by his uh, curiosity also. And we, we talked about US imperialism. We talked about 9-11. We talked about the Iraq war and, and the lies of Colin Powell. And we all actually also talked about life after death because he was so, so interested in so many topics. And so I was interested in many topics. And I think it's just a beautiful example um, that human beings across the world are interested in peace. I'm, I'm, I'm a researcher here in Switzerland and he was a researcher in the United States. And when I was asked um, to, to give a lecture today about wars and about deception and about peace, I, I said oh, it would be an honor. It would absolutely be an honor uh, to do that because I, I, I'm fully convinced and I know from my personal experience uh, that David Ray Griffin uh, was a, an outstanding uh, person, an outstanding scholar who, who really dedicated his, his entire work um, to the peace movement. I also um, have a, a book here of him that I read, Omissions and Distortions. That was a, a book on, on the 9-11 Commission Report. I, I used to, to read that together with my students. So that's the official story on 9-11. And just to pick one of the 50 plus box books that David wrote, this is another book which shows that this book is inaccurate. So he went really into, into uh, the important topics. He also wrote on, uh, on the war in Ukraine. I'm going to briefly touch on that. The book that I wrote is this one, Ruthless Empire. It's been originally been published in Germany. But that's the English translation, which is now out. It has attracted a lot of attention in the German-speaking world. It was sold more than 100,000 uh, copies, which is, which is a good number in the German-speaking world. And in the book, I touch on different subjects. And one of the subjects I touch upon is, uh, is Pearl Harbor. So in, in my lecture today, I, I want to start with Pearl Harbor, which, which obviously is, is, is an event which is far away. But I still think it is important to look at Pearl Harbor again. Why? Because Pearl Harbor, for, for maybe people who are younger uh, and attend this lecture, it is important to recall that Pearl Harbor was the moment when the United States entered into World War II. And the situation at that time was such that there was a lot of resistance in the United States from the population. There were many people who did not want to go to war uh, against Germany or against Japan. And uh, they said, that's not our war. We don't, we don't want to go into this war. And according to the research um, that I went through, I think it was the American president, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who then, you know, managed events so that the US population would go to war. And I want to look at that in more detail because it's important to understand that wars always start with deceptions. And if we in the peace movement, and I know there are people from many different countries who, who, who look at that lecture, if we in the peace movement understand that wars start with deceptions, um, I think then we can also look, search for the deceptions very specifically when a war breaks out. The um, attack on, on Pearl Harbor was on December 7, 1941. Uh, uh, some 2,400 people were killed. And obviously, at the time, there was no television, okay? 
there was no internet, obviously, and there were no televised uh, online conference like we have now today. People were, were basically reliant on newspaper and the, the newspaper that came out at the, the time, the day after the attack, so that was December 8th, said um, Japan opens surprise war on U.S., hundreds killed uh, in attack. And it's always important to, to ask the question, surprise? Well, okay, surprise for the U.S. population. But was everybody surprised? You know, that's, that's very important to, to investigate. I mean, if we talk about a surprise and people who buy the newspaper, obviously they were surprised. They didn't know that a Japanese attack was coming. But looking back at the data, um, it is important to ask the question, was the US government also surprised? The people on the street um, were obviously impressed. They were imp impressed by what they saw. They say they saw that the US and Japan are now at war. They, the, in the newspapers, you could read that Hawaii was bombed, that the Philippines, which at the time were a U.S. colony, were bombed. And people, when they read something in the newspaper, that's a picture from, um, from uh, New York, probably taken on, on the 8th of December in 1941, not the 7th. And, and it just shows that people's feelings were stirred up by, by the event itself. People did not know how to react. And, when, when something breaks out, people look for the president and um, he then says what will be done. So it, very important for me as a historian to find out, did Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually know that the Jap Japanese were going to attack? Uh, it is well known that Roosevelt was the US president from 1933 to his death in 1945 when he was replaced by President Truman. And the, the main question I'm interested in my book is, did he know Japan was going to attack? So the Second World War is just one chapter in the book. Uh, and the, the researchers that work on it, they say, if he knew that the Japanese, Japanese were going to attack, then we call it a Lehop operation. Let it happen on purpose. And that is a trick. Uh, it is a trick to confuse the population. You basically, in that trick, uh, sacrifice part of your population, so your own soldiers, um, and the blood spilled then will, you know, make the population very angry or sad or both. And with that, these emotions, you can then lead uh, the U.S. into a war, which otherwise would have been much more difficult. And I'm personally convinced that Roosevelt knew that Japan was going to attack, and I'm personally convinced. Um, uh, that this can be shown historically. But you will obviously meet other historians who say, no, no, Roosevelt was, was totally surprised. He didn't know that the Japanese was going, were going to attack. And you also find historians who say it's, it's completely um, insane to even suggest that a president would sacrifice more than 2,000 of his own uh, soldiers. I mean, you know, that nobody would do that. I disagree. I disagree. So I... I, I urge everybody to look at Pearl Harbor 1941 and make up your own mind. I can only give you some elements. I can tell you that the Office of Naval Intelligence, which was the American, um, one of the secret services of the United States at the time, they were able to intercept the communication of the Japanese. So, you know, before the Japanese attacked, they had communication. And this uh, communication was intercepted by the Office of Naval Intelligence, and they were able to, to, to understand what the Japanese were saying. Um, the US Office of Naval Intelligence had succeeded in intercepting and decrypting. That's also important. You have to be able to break the codes. Um, and that was both the diplomatic and the military communication of the Japanese. And that now is important without the Japanese taking notice of it. And Robert Stinnett is actually the American historian who's, and he's a journalist who, who actually explained this in great detail. I have the German version of his book and I, I read it and, you know, congratulations to the man. He, he's an American citizen and, and uh, 
he certainly had too much. He 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 w- he stood up and said, "There's something wrong with Pearl Harbor. I, I want to know what happened." And the intercepted data at the time was extremely valuable and was referred to as magic, and within the naval intelligence. And only President Roosevelt and his closest advisors had access to the magic information. The one of the um, uh, important actors who had access to the magic data at the time was uh, General George Marshall, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he said, we know what they know, but they don't know that we know it. So he was, he was talking about the Japanese. And the, uh, the Japanese actually didn't know that the Americans had been able to break their code. And the scra- transcripts of the radio interceptions were then placed in a, in a le- leather briefcase at the Naval Office in Washington. And then an ONI officer delivered to President Roosevelt at the White House every day these, these uh, text messages. And so the president monitored the Japanese and shared the information only with his closest aides. For instance, President Roosevelt did not inform the commanders, the U.S. commanders, uh, who, who were actually, you know, mil- high-ranking military officers in, in Hawaii, that the attack was coming. So for them, it was a surprise. He didn't in- inform Congress, so for, for Parliament, it was a surprise. Roosevelt also didn't inform the U.S. population, so for them, it was also a surprise. So to sum up, I'm not saying that, that many people were surprised. Obviously, yes, millions were surprised. But that doesn't mean that everybody was surprised. And that just from a historical perspective, it's very important to keep these two things apart. Um, one, of the, one of the members of the Office of Naval Intelligence was later asked, you know, I mean, you sacrifice more than 2,000 people. I mean, isn't that disgusting? Uh, how can you do that? And then he said, you know, we, we had to provoke Japan to, to do the first shot you know and then we could act as you know um as a retaliation so we first cut off the oil supplies japan because us at the time was sending oil across the pacific to japan japan has no oil nothing not zero and obviously if you if you're an aggressive nation and japan at that time was very aggressive attacking china other parts of southeast asia they needed oil and they hoped that the U.S. would just send them the oil uh, that they needed for their, for their imperial conquests. And then um, in 1941, so exactly the same year that we have Pearl Harbor, um, U.S. President Roosevelt cut off all oil supplies to Japan. That was a very significant moment when a Jap- Japanese ship, ship crossed the Atlantic, you know, came from Japan and, and, and went through, not the Atlantic, sorry, the Pacific and landed at, at the west coast of the US. It came empty. And then Roosevelt said, we're not gonna give them any oil. And it went back empty. <laughs> and, and at that time, the Japanese realized, okay, we're not gonna get any oil anymore from the US. And the um, Office of Naval Intelligence Officer, I'd like to quote here, is um, Joseph Rushforth. In July, 1941, four months before Pearl Harbor, the U.S. shut down oil exports to Japan. And Rushford says, we cut off their access to their money, their fuel, and their trade. We tightened the screws more and more. They saw no other means than war to get out of this stranglehold. So uh, Rushford says it was, it was a deliberate strategy to, to basically cut off the oil and, and provoke Japan to fire the first shot. And then um, after the Japanese raid on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, and the death of 2,000 foreign U.S. citizens, Rushford said it was a pretty cheap price to pay for the unanimity of the nation. So I I was struck when I read that, a cheap price to pay. And, And what I want to point out here is that people who are in, in the realm of military strategy they think completely different than everybody else, okay? They think it is very normal to use deception. We need to use deception, especially in a democracy, because in a democracy, people have certain rights, they can vote, 
uh, they can elect their leaders, etc. And if the leader says, we're not going to go to war, we're not going to go to war, then the leader cannot suddenly break his promise and say, okay, now we go to war. But of course, if it's possible to provoke the other side to attack a country first, then people will be very emotional. And that was the whole strategy of Pearl Harbor. Um, the U.S. Pacific Fleet uh, originally had its, its base in California. And uh, then it was recommended to put it further out into Pacific, Pacific. So it was transferred to Pearl Harbor, to Hawaii, out in the Pacific, closer to Japan, um, to, to make it easier for, for the Japanese to attack. And also the U.S. Um, uh, military leaders made sure that the aircraft carriers were not in Pearl Harbor at the day when, when the Japanese attacked, because they knew that they needed these aircraft carrier afterwards um, to fight against Japan. So to sum it up, uh, Pearl Harbor 1941, according to my analysis, was a Lee Hop operation, let it happen on purpose. The U.S. population was surprised. The U.S. Congress was surprised. Um, the military commanders in Hawaii were surprised, but President Roosevelt was not surprised. So it's a very small group in Washington and the Pentagon um, who knew that the attack was coming um, because they had broken the codes of the Japanese with uh, Operation Magic. Now let's jump, let's leave World War uh, II behind us and let's jump to, to Vietnam. Let's go to the Gulf of Tonkin. Um, Vietnam obviously is a, is a country south of China. And during the Cold War, um, Vietnam went some, some brutal times, has to be said like that. I mean, during the Second World War, the Japanese conquered the country and it was, uh, brutal occupation of Vietnam during, during the Second World War by Japan. And at the time Japan withdrew, um, the French came back because Andochine was a, used to be a French colony. That was Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia together. So the French immediately after the Second World War tried to, to gain control of Southeast Asia again. And there's an interesting debate in the French parliament and the French sent their troops to Andochine at the end of the Second World War. Um, one parliamentarian, it was a woman, said, well, what, what's the difference now? We've just been conquered by Germany, and now we've been liberated, and the Second World War is over. Now, what's the difference if we send our troops to Vietnam and conquer them? Are we then not acting like the Germans did in 1940 when they invaded France? And so everybody was up and angry and shouting at her. But she had, you know, she had said the truth. It was exactly the truth that she said. But she was, she was really escorted out of Parliament in Paris at the time. Um, so, you know, the French failed to control Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnamese fought against uh, the French colonialists and the French were sent home. And after the French, the Americans came. The Americans came and tried to you know, to control Vietnam. Um, and they had, if you look at the map, there's the Gulf of Tonkin. The map is in, in German because I do most of my talks in German. Gulf von Tonkin, which is basically means Gulf of Tonkin, not, not so difficult to understand. And in the Gulf of Tonkin, something happened, and that was in 1964. And the U.S. population then read North Vietnamese, okay, Vietnam at the time was split in two, like North and South Korea. And they say no, the North was the Communist Party and the South was, 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 uh, was allied with the U.S. And then the newspaper wrote, okay, the North Vietnamese have attacked a U.S. destroyer. So that's a ship, an American ship. And that's this ship. It's the USS Maddox. And people, at that time, we had television, okay, so they, they didn't only have the newspaper, but there was no internet. So it would not have been possible, you know, to have this uh, online uh, video talk uh, like we have now in 2023. But at that time, they, they didn't have internet. They just had the newspaper or had, they had the president who was, who was making a statement on television. At the, and at the time, the president said that the USS Maddox 
had been there in, in, in the Gulf of Tonkin and that the North Vietnamese had attacked this ship. That was the claim. And who was president? It was President Johnson. Johnson came into power after Kennedy was shot in Dallas. Kennedy was shot, US President uh, John F. Kennedy was shot in Dallas in 1963. There's also a chapter on, on, on the killing of uh, John F. Kennedy. I'm, I'm not, conv- I, I don't think that Lee Harvey Oswald was uh, the, the, the murder, the assassin of Kennedy. Completely disagree with that one. But um, that's another chapter I'm going to go into. I'm going to go to the Vietnam story. But Kennedy was shot. Johnson comes in. And Johnson then escalates the war in Vietnam. Kennedy wanted to withdraw the special forces at the time, which were already in Vietnam. But then Johnson goes on television and he says, on August 4, 1964, in a speech broadcast late at night, um, he said that North Vietnamese had attacked the USS Maddox twice. And that was a lie. Right there. He said it that way. As I say, there's always deception going hand in hand with wars. And he said this. As president and commander in chief, it is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. The initial attack on the destroyer Maddox on August 2nd was repeated today, thus August 4, by a number of hostile vessels. This new act of aggression aimed directly at our own forces again brings home to all of us in the United States the importance of the struggle for peace and security in Southeast Asia. Now, that's an interesting, interesting quote from the president. I can just tell you that's lies. It's all lies. I mean, he used the trick. It was the same trick like Pearl Harbor. In Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt said the Japanese attacked. And we were surprised. Now, Roosevelt was right. The Japanese had really attacked. But the lie was that he was not surprised. Okay? I've, I've explained that uh, a small group of people in the government knew that the attack was coming and then let, let it happen on purpose. Now, this second attack didn't happen at all. Okay, The USS Maddox was not attacked on August 4, 1964. And how do we know? How do we know? The National Security Agency, that's the NSA, which you know um, closely looks at international communications. The NSA um, declassified more than 140 formerly top secret documents on the Gulf of Tonkin incident in December 2005. So roughly 20 years ago. And Including uh, in this uh, documentation was a study by NSA historian Robert Hanyok. His picture is, is shown below. And this study confirms what other historians had long suspected, that there was no attack on US ships in the Gulf of Tonkin on August 4. Quote, the overwhelming body of reports, if used, would have told the story that no attack occurred. So that's really sad, isn't it? There was no attack on the Maddox. But the soldiers went to Vietnam. And they fought in Vietnam. They were crippled. They lost their leg, their arm, their eye. Many were traumatized. 58,000 US soldiers were killed. And 3 million Vietnamese were killed. So again, slaughter, brutality, trauma. And the peace movement, the peace movement both in the United States as well as in Europe, as well as in Vietnam and Japan and, and, and Germany, was shocked. You know, the peace movement again was looking at this and going, how come this happens? How, why do soldiers go to war? And I've looked at one specific soldier in my book. So there's one chapter on Pearl Harbor, a chapter on North Kennedy, and a chapter on the Vietnam War. And I've looked at one specific soldier and his name is William Earhart. And the picture on the left shows him in Vietnam in 1967. And the picture on the right shows him in 2017 in the US. And he joined the peace movement later. So first he was, he was a soldier and later he joined the peace movement. So he's a very interesting person. Um, he's seen uh, war firsthand. And he, when he looked back, you know, when he looked back at, uh, 
at the war in Vietnam. He said, I just trusted the, the president. I trusted my teachers. And I trusted the New York Times. The president, the leading newspaper, the New York Times, and my teacher. What I was told at school. Um, and that's dangerous. That's really dangerous. If you blindly trust the president, the leading newspaper, and your teachers. I'm not saying don't trust your teachers ever again. But um, I'm saying the teachers don't get the story right all the time. That's very important to find out. Here, here's his quote. Uh, age 17, he joined the Marines and he fought for 13 months in Vietnam. And his quote is, when the government said that the communists were taking over Vietnam, and if we didn't stop them there, we would have to stop them eventually in San Diego in, in the U.S. I took that at face value. I had no reason at that time to distrust my government, my teachers, or the New York Times. I think that's something very important we can learn. You know, We now know Johnson had lied, and we see that the soldier had put all his trust in the president, and it was misplaced trust, okay? He risked his life while Johnson just lied. So it's very important um, to see that governments are able to lie. That's something we need to understand. There's no reason to blindly follow and trust your government, you know? There's no reason to do that. It's much better to think for yourself and to dig deep. Um, there were at the time, you know, journalists who said, you know, there's something wrong with the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Um, and we now know that uh, the CIA had, su had supplied ships to South Vietnam, small ships, petrol boats. And these ships had, you know, crossed in from South Vietnam into North Vietnam. As, as I said, Vietnam was, you know, split into two countries. And these small petrol boats then had attacked the communication infrastructure of North Vietnam and blown up um, arms caches and such, such stuff. So, you know, just small operations. And so they, the South had provoked the North. That was step one. And step two was the Maddox then went into the Gulf of Tonkin. And seen from the North Vietnamese, uh, that gave the impression as if the Maddox, you know, was protecting these small boats. And so the North Vietnamese reacted and they sent torpedoes, but they didn't hit the Maddox. They hit, didn't hit the Maddox at all. The ship was never sunk. Not even, it wasn't, there was no, there was no attack on, on August 4. There was a small skirmish on August 2. But all this together was twisted around by US President Johnson. And he lied to the American public. I'm very sorry to say that, but my research says the Vietnam War, the entire Vietnam War, was based on lies. It's hard to realize things like that when you have more than 3 million people uh, dead in a country. And I'd, I'd like to, to leave the Vietnam War behind and go to another topic. Uh, I'd like to go to Gladio and Ukraine. Gladio um, is something which not many people know about. It was a, a secret army uh, set up in Western Europe um, and coordinated by NATO. There's a so-called stay-behind army. The idea was if, if, if a Soviet invasion had ever happened and you know if Soviet troops had ever occupied Western Europe, you know, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, then, you know, NATO uh, would need a guerrilla structure, a secret army, who would then become activate, uh, active and, and fight a Soviet occupation. That was, that was an idea in this Gladio thing. And I, I, I want to show that also in this topic, we have deception. I worked on, on the Gladio topic for many years, and I just briefly want to touch on it. And then I want to touch on the war in Ukraine, because that's a war which is ongoing as we speak. Okay, I'm coming from the Second World War, and many people will say, well, that's long ago. And I'm going on uh, mentioning Vietnam, and some people say, well, Vietnam War, that's long ago. But I'm actually coming to Ukraine now, and I will add a few words on Gaza. And these are the two wars which now in 2023, as, as the year comes to a close, these wars are still going on and people go to church at Christmas and 
uh, they are reminded of, of the fact uh, you shall not kill, right? And, and many people, millions, go to church now at Christmas. And, you know, they exchange presents. And, but the most important thing, really, if you, if you really take that seriously, you shall not kill, is, is that we stop the war in Ukraine and that we stop the war in Gaza. But in order to do this, we, we need to understand the geostrategic context of both conflicts. And let us start with Ukraine. Let us start with NATO. NATO um, is obviously the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And uh, the US is the country which is in charge, uh, which, which leads NATO, which, which controls NATO. And uh, Canada is also in NATO. But uh, you see the green countries there. So that's Portugal, that's France, that's Germany, that's UK, Norway, and Turkey, and Poland, and Greece, and Romania. Quite a few other countries are, are part of NATO. I, I'm in Switzerland. I'm based in Switzerland. We're not part of NATO. So that's that small white dot in the middle of the NATO countries. I'm, I'm a critic of NATO. Uh, I say NATO is a, is a very dangerous organization and people just don't realize how dangerous it is. And why do I think that? I have um, published a book which I call um, NATO's Secret Armies. I published this book in uh, 2005, almost 20 years ago now. And there I describe Operation Gladio. And that was a covert operation which was uncovered in 1990 at the end of the Cold War when Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti confirmed that the CIA, so that's the US Secret Service, and the MI6, that's the British Secret Service, and NATO, that's the largest military alliance on Earth, uh, trained and directed an underground army of paramilitary unions across Europe. In Italy, the Stay Behind Army was called Gladio, and the the tragic thing really is, and that, that, that's something very hard to, to talk about, is that it linked up with right-wing extremists, people from Ordine Nuovo, um, and carried out false flag terror attacks to undermine political opponents. So Gladio and this question of terrorism are, 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 closely, are closely linked. We cannot go in this talk into all the details that are necessary, but I just want to to remind you that we don't have only NATO uh, on, on a visible structure, but we also have NATO as part of the deep state, uh, an in, in, invisible structure. People didn't know in Italy that there was a secret army. People didn't know in France or in Belgium that there was a secret army. Um, the uh, revelation really happened in 1990 when Giulio Andreotti, who was then prime minister, uh, um, said uh, on August 3, that there is a secret army called Gladio. He said the, the CIA, so the American Secret Service, and the MI6, the British Secret Service, had set it up. He said that. You know, people were going crazy. They were like, what? There's a secret army in Italy. We don't have, we shouldn't have a secret army. And the French defense minister at the time was in Italy. That, his name was uh, Guy Cohen. And, and, and he said, is there also a secret army in Belgium? And then Andreotti said, yes, there is. And he said, how come I don't know? I'm the defense minister of Belgium. I should, I should be informed, I guess. <laughs> no, he wasn't informed. He went to, he flew back to Belgium, to Brussels. Brussels is the capital of Belgium. And uh, he talked to his chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So that's the highest military officer in Belgium. He said, do we have a, do we have a secret army? Like Andreotti said, uh, and the chief of staff said, yes, sir. Yes, we do. And then the defense minister said, why don't I know about it? And the general said, well, you know, you're just a politician. Politicians come and go. And we are here, the army. We're here for eternity. And obviously, that is a very strange understanding of democracy. If, if the army runs secret operations and, and says nobody's supposed to know about them, it is, uh, it is illegal. It is, strictly speaking, illegal to have a, a secret army. And also in Switzerland, in, um, the country where I was born, where I live, where I am right now, uh, there was a secret army. It was called P-26. So they had different names in different countries. And the uh, Swiss population was completely, completely surprised to find that. That was also in 1990 when that was discovered, that there was a secret army. And the defense minister in Switzerland didn't even know about it. Kaspar Filigo was his name. He said, I wasn't informed. So we're talking here about parallel structures. And um, 
the highest ranking military officer at the time in NATO was John Galvin. It's always the US general who is the sucker. Sucker is the supreme ally command of Europe. And so Galvin in 1990 confirmed in Brussels, that's the capital of Belgium, in front of NATO ambassadors, the existence of the stay behind armies. And he said that these armies were coordinated by NATO's Supreme Headqu uh, Headquarters Allied Powers Europe shape. So it is absolutely clear and it is absolutely certain that stay behind armies existed during the Cold War, roughly from 1950 to 1990, in uh, basically all countries of Western Europe. We have these secret armies in, in Turkey, in Greece, uh, in Italy, in Belgium, in the western part of Germany, in France in Portugal, in Spain, in Luxembourg, and in Norway. And we even have these secret armies in neutral countries like Switzerland, Austria, Sweden, and Finland. They were not part of NATO during the Cold War. Um, and that is still a very sensitive topic, and most people don't even know what Gladio is. But the most tricky part is when uh, once one tries to research the link between these secret armies and terrorist attacks, because there were terrorist attacks in Italy, there were terrorist attacks in Turkey, in Belgium, during the Cold War. And now researchers try to find out, was there a link between that secret army and the terrorist attacks? Very, very complicated, because the secret armies, and that is known, they had arms caches. So they had explosive, they had munitions, they had rifles, that communication equipment, because the CIA and the MI6 said, well, you know, in case a Soviet invasion comes, we need these secret soldiers to be equipped. Okay, they cannot then go shopping and buy explosives. <laughs> and, you know, that makes sense. If you want to set up a guerrilla, then you need to have them supplied with explosives. But the Soviet invasion never came. Okay, never came. So, logically thinking, the stay behind armies should never have been activated at all, at all. There was no Soviet invasion. There should have been no activation. But then now it turns out that NATO officers were scared that in Italy, for instance, the communists would come to power. And then if you have a communist defense minister, it never happened, never happened. But if, you know, then this communist defense minister would betray all the secrets of NATO countries, for instance, to the Soviet Union. So what, what happened is you had terrorist attacks in Italy and they were blamed on the left and that weakened the communists. And later it was found out that these terrorist attacks had not been carried out by the left, by, but by the extreme right. I know it's a little complicated, but it's important to look at it. There's one terrorist attack that I now take uh, is the terrorist attack of Peteano. Peteano is a little village in Italy in 1971. That, that, uh, sorry, 72, 1972. Uh, on the 31st of May, um, there was a car there, and then that car was abandoned at the side of the road, and then the police was called and said, there's a strange car there, can you check it out? And the police went there and opened uh, the door of the car, and then the bomb went off, and three policemen were killed. And later, there was another, you know, expert saying, this was the Red Brigades, which was left extremists in Italy. And this discredited the entire political left in Italy. And then years went by. And in the, in the 1980s, at the late 1980s, um, a judge in Italy looked at the data again and he found out it's all wrong. You know, it's full of lies. That was um, uh, Felice Casson, who was an Italian uh, judge, looked at the data and he said, we need to look at this terrorist attack in Petrona again. And he found the guy who was responsible, Vincenzo Vinciguerra, who then was sent to prison. Okay. But he was not a left-wing extremist, he was a right-wing extremist from Ordine Nuovo. And he said, there is a NATO secret army. Okay. And people didn't believe him. He said, a secret army? And he said, yes, yes. And they protect us. We're doing this and they, they are behind us. Nobody wanted to believe him. But then th three years later, it came true. Uh, it was confirmed by Giulio Andreotti that the secret armies existed. So just to sum this up, 
we know that there were NATO secret armies. We know that there were terrorist attacks. Now, be between these two things, it's very difficult to prove that NATO wanted the terrorist attacks to happen because there were former CIA directors like William Colby who later said, yes, yes, sure, we had Operation Gladio. Sure, we had to stay behind, of course. But the terrorist attacks, no, no, we, we never wanted that. That was just some crazy guys who did this. We, we never wanted that. So there's always this um, plausible denial structure built into the structure. Let's leave Glad Gladio. It's a long topic. And let's, let's look at the structure of, of NATO in, at the end of the Cold War. You see Germany is divided. BRD is Bundesrepublik Deutschland and DDR is Deutsche Demokratische Republik. So like North and South Korea, uh, Germany was divided in the Cold War. And now watch closely to this uh, eastern part of Germany where the Soviets had their troops. The Soviets withdrew their troops and zack, Germany was uh, reunited. So I go back again. So that's Cold War. And that's at the end of the Cold War. So NATO becomes a little bigger and the job, Soviets withdraw all their troops. That's, you know, Gorbachev who had promised, I withdraw all my troops. The, the Soviets at that time and the Russians who, who, who then in 1991 followed the Soviet Union said, we don't want NATO to expand. And U.S. President Bush and Foreign Minister Secretary of State uh, James Baker promised NATO would not expand, but that was not true. Look at that. In 1999, Poland, Czech Republic and Hungary joined NATO. And then in 2004, Romania, um, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, um, and uh, Slovakia and Slovenia joined. You know. So NATO expanded more and more, and then you have Croatia and Albania joining in 2009, and you have smaller nations uh, like Montenegro and North Macedonia joining in 2020. But basically, NATO expanded closer to the Soviet Union, expanded closer to Russia, sorry. And the missing bit was really Ukraine. Okay, So um, there wasn't an attempt there was an attempt to bring Ukraine into NATO. And that, that to me, uh, is, is the whole reason for the war in Ukraine. Um, Finland, by the way, joined in 2023. So NATO has now 31 members. And in Europe, we start to reflect more critically on NATO, at least those who are in the peace movement. They say, what, what's going on with NATO? It, it tries to drag Ukraine into NATO. And that has then, you know ignited a Russian invasion of Ukraine. So that's really, really dangerous because that's all very close to, to our borders. And the critical moment that was also um, researched by David Ray Griffin, the critical moment was really the year 2014. It was not the Soviet invasion of February 2022. The critical moment was 2014. And at that time, and David, real, David Ray Griffin very much realized this as well, uh, as, as uh, Ray McGovern and, and others have, have, have said, or, or Mersham, or John Mersham, or Jeffrey Sachs, Benjamin Adelop. There's quite a few people in the US have realized this. They say, in 2014, there was a coup d'etat in Ukraine. And this, uh, in, this coup d'etat was basically, was basically run by US President Barack Obama, and Joe Biden was vice president. And responsible um, for it was Victoria Nuland. Victoria Nuland, um, um, Under Secretary of State at the time, um, triggered that coup d'etat in Ukraine, that uh, in Kiev, which is the capital of Ukraine, in February 20, 2014, snipers shot both demonstrators and police alike. And that plunged the country into chaos. And President Viktor Yanukovych and Prime Minister Nikolai Azarov were forced to resign. So it's very important if we look at secret operations to look at the snipers of 2040 who killed both demonstrators and, and police officers who, who were, you know, engaged in, in battles for weeks. And suddenly you have snipers who go into the building. We know which buildings, Ho Hotel Ukraine, for instance. And from there, they shoot both demonstrators and police officers and then the demonstrators and the police officers think oh it was the other side no it was a third group who, who moved in quickly and moved out so that's very very important when we researched the coup d'etat in 2014 in ukraine and at the u.s state department victoria newland had been pulling the strings 
uh, along with Jeffrey Payet, Jeffrey should read there, there's a mistake in the slide, the US ambassador to Ukraine. For, and the, then there was a phone conversation between Newland and, and Ambassador Payet, in which they discussed the composition of the new government before the coup. And this phone uh, call was intercepted and, and caused an uproar in, in Europe because Newland had um, insulted the European Union by saying, fuck the, EU, fuck the European Union. I have this coup d'etat here in my book. And I say, this is the reason, you know, this is the reason why we have this war uh, going on in, in Ukraine. And the problem is many mainstream media um, don't want to talk about the coup d'etat in 2014. They only want to talk about the Russian invasion of 2022, which is illegal. You know, Russia has no right to invade Ukraine. Uh, like, you know, U.S. President Bush had no right uh, to attack Iraq in 2003. That's just strictly forbidden uh, by the UN Charter. But, you know, most people don't care about the UN Charter. And it's also forbidden to carry out a coup d'etat in, uh, in Kiev in 2014. And that was done. And right-wing extremists were involved. So you, you, you have a very, very strange situation. First, you have NATO expanding east. And then, you know, they, they reach that limit, Ukraine, and they say, oh, we should, we should move a little further east. But there's the wrong government in Kiev. They don't want to become a member of NATO. Well, we, we just overthrow them. And this has led to a situation where we now see Russia and China teaming up. You know, they're, 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 they're being closer together because that we're not taking this anymore. And that strategically is, is, is a big, big blunder from the part of the U.S., because they, they have their biggest rivals now becoming partners, especially because of that coup d'etat in Ukraine. So that's why I wanted to, to come from, from Pearl Harbor, where I say Roosevelt knew that the Japanese were attacking. But he let it happen to you know, make his population angry. When I moved to Vietnam, I said Johnson knew that there was no attack on the Maddox, but he just lied to his own population. He didn't care. He just wanted a reason to bomb Vietnam. Then I moved on to Gladio, Operation Gladio, secret warfare during the Cold War. And um, on this reflection about, about Gladio, I added the, the element in Ukraine because Gladio was, was run by NATO and, and the expansion of NATO from 1990 to 2023, to this very year we are in, um, ha has really increased the insecurity in Europe. It's not the security. NATO always says we increase security. <laughs> People believe it if they don't, if they're not well informed. But if you look at Operation Gladiator, you go like, no, I don't trust NATO anymore. And if you if you see, look at the coup d'état in Kiev in 2014, then you go. You create just chaos here. You, you should, I think, you know, NATO should be dissolved, really. It should be dissolved. First, it should be investigated. It should be investigated what, what happened in NATO's history. NATO was formed in 1949. And 9-11 really was the day when, it, when NATO was activated. And that brings me to point number four. Um, NATO has the biggest military alliance on, on, on the world. It says, we're never... We're never going to attack another country unless we're, we're being attacked first. Now, that's a lie. That's a lie. In 1999, uh, NATO bombed Serbia. Serbia had never attacked NATO. And furthermore, it was an out-of-area operation. NATO always said, we're just going to act within the area where we are. Serbia was not, was far away from NATO territory at the time, in 1999. And at the second point, when NATO was activated, was after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Um, President Bush then said, okay, this is an attack from Afghanistan. It's an attack on the U.S. The U.S. is a NATO member, so we have to invoke um, uh, NATO Charter Clause Number 5, which means an attack on one member is an attack on all. And then the Germans went to Afghanistan, the French went to Afghanistan, the Americans went to Afghanistan, the Italians went to Afghanistan, all the troops went to Afghanistan. 20 years of war, many, many people killed. And now we realize it's all lies. 9-11 is full of lies. I'm not going to go into details because I know that 9-11 is a topic that is being covered very well among the people who are listening to this channel. 
And I'm just going to quote Graham McQueen, who is another peace researcher who is outstanding. Uh, Graham died in this year, in 2023. And I think we have to pay tribute not only to David Ray Griffin, but also to Graham McQueen. They're outstanding US, US or Canadian scholars who, who stand up for truth. And I think that's what we need. We really need the Europeans and the Americans and the Chinese and the Japanese and the people in Africa and South America to link up in order to understand that wars are based on deception. Wars are based on deception. Graham says, 9-11 was a tremendous war trigger. It led to the destruction of nations. I mean, Afghanistan, Iraq war was linked to it. We know the weapons of mass destruction story, ABC of Colin Powell at the UN Security Council was a lie. It led to a lot of deaths and refugees. I mean, if we talk about refugees, we also need to talk about NATO. NATO is creating a lot of net refugees. And US imperialism is creating a lot of refugees. We cannot accept it because it's a fraud. I think I really like, I, I, I like Graham for that. I mean, we, we talked on the phone and uh, I, I, really, I really have respect for the man. He just said how it is. He said, it's a fraud. 9-11 is a fraud. And see, many people don't dare to say that. They say, okay, yeah, I mean, come on, yeah, it's unclear. <laughs> but why, why don't you call a spade a spade? 9-11 is a, is a fraud. People were lied to. And um, he, he then says, I've been an anti-war activist. I've done my best and I can go with a satisfied mind. And he said that uh, when he already knew that he was going to die soon. And I think that's, that's ultimately the challenge for all of us. That we have to be able to go with a satisfied mind. Um, there's no way to, prefer, to prevent our own death. I mean, I'm now 51. I don't know how many longer, how many years I have. But I know just from observation that everybody dies at a certain point. Some, some don't make even 10 years. Some die at 20, others die at 30, others at 40, others at 50. And some, some, some live longer than 90 years. My, my, my father, he, he died at the, the age of 92. So he had a long life, but he died. Everybody has to die. And I think the peace movement realizes that, um, in order to prepare for your own death, it is a very noble, a very noble um, task to work for peace. Just help other people explain how wars work, how deception works, and that we shouldn't kill each other. And I, I, uh, as, when, I, when I recall, David Ray Griffin always said that, uh, that life doesn't end you know, with death. We just lose our body. The soul lives on. And um, I think Graham McQueen had the same perspective. He was, he was totally at ease the way I've seen him in the movie. Peace, War, 9-11. I mean, it's a movie everybody should, should watch. So I don't, I don't go into the details um, on 9-11 because I know that people who, who, who are gathering here, they know that 9-11 is, is at least worth investigating or they know that it's a fraud. In my book, in this book, I say uh, the blowing up of World Trade Center 7 is, is obviously controlled demolition. And just my own personal story on that, uh, it was in 2006, many years ago now, when I wrote that in, in a Swiss newspaper, I said, you know, World Trade Center 7, that's controlled demolition. And I quoted uh, Hugo Bachmann and, and Jörg Schneidel, the, the two professors for architecture here in Switzerland. It was the first time that we had this debate in Switzerland. And I was working at the Center for Security Studies of ETH Zurich at the time. And I, I, I immediately came under tremendous pressure. They told me to shut up. They told me not to investigate 9-11. And the US Embassy wrote an article. Well, they didn't write an article. They gave an interview to the Swiss press. Uh, and the journalists started calling me a conspiracy theorist. So if you, if you dare to stand up and say 9-11 is a lie, you're going you're gonna to be slandered right away. But I think that's, that's nothing that should scare a historian. I mean, historians have to speak truth to power. And if they get slandered, that might be a sign that they're right. You know, that's just uh, how it is. I mean, my, my entry in Wikipedia is really bad. I know why it is. I mean, 
because I say I, I don't believe the story that Bush presented on 9-11. So it's always important to question narratives, um, especially when it comes to, to wars. And the current war we're talking about is the war in Gaza. You see there that small little bit bordering, um, uh, bordering obviously the Mediterranean Sea and Israel is bombing the Gaza Strip. Uh, and we we know that on October, on October 7, 2023, so, you know, just a few weeks ago, um, that new war broke out and uh, the debate is now, how, how come? What happened? You know, we've, we've, we've been at Pearl Harbor, we've looked at the Gulf of Tonkin, we've look, looked at Gladio, we've looked at NATO expansion to the east. We've looked at Ukraine, but the other war is 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 really the the war in Israel and uh, and 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 Palestine. So the Gaza Strip situation is is dreadful. It's dreadful, and this is how it looks. This is how it looks in, in the Gaza Strip. So Israel is leveling this. They're just killing thousands of people, and. What is the Hamas invasion plan called Yerucho War? Okay, that's uh, something which is being debated. And um, we learn from the New York Times that Israel knew Hamas attack plan more than a year ago. And um, this, is a, this is a report which is now from November 30, that is just a few days old. And it says Israeli officials obtained Hamas battle plan for the October 7 terrorist attack more than a year before it happened. So they knew the attack was coming? Not necessarily. It just means they knew that Hamas had such a plan. But now Israel says we didn't know that they were really going to carry it out. So that's something that needs to be that that needs to be investigated. And there's many there are many Israeli journalists who also wonder. I mean, what happened on that day, October 7, 2023? How did Hamas succeed in crossing first of all the fence? You know, get out of Gaza because Gaza is really fenced in. It's very difficult to get out of Gaza. There are checkpoints, but you, if you want to pass the checkpoints, you obviously need to pay, have papers, and the Hamas couldn't just you know, go through the checkpoints. And then why? That is one of the debates that is really going on right now. Why were there five hours? The, the, the attack started at 6.30 in the morning. Why, during five hours, was there no reaction from the Israeli Defense Forces idea? Um, this is something which is being debated, for instance, in, in Germany. Uh, one professor from the German Bundeswehr says, we know from the interrogation of Hamas fighters who were captured that they were not able to move free, that, not, that they were able, sorry, to move freely for five hours before they met with the first resistance. That, of course, reminds me of Pearl Harbor. Of course. Could it be that Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu let Hamas kill Israeli citizens for five hours before he stepped in? I don't know. It's just a question. But it's not a question that only I ask. It's also a question that Israeli journalist Efrat Fenningsen asks. That's the lady. Israel journalist Efrat Fenningsen says, I served at the Gaza border 25 years ago. So she, she was in the Israeli army. Even a cat walking along that fence would have alerted the IDF. So that's the Israeli Defense Forces. Why did nothing happen on October 7 for five hours? Did unknown groups let this happen on purpose? Now, thing is, I don't know. I don't know. Just looking at the data. I'm looking at the data and I see that right now we have a debate about Lihop regarding Gaza. The Gaza war. It, what is undebatable is that the Gaza war broke out on 7 October 2023. That is, you know, on the historical record. We know that Hamas crossed into Israel at 6.30. That is on the record. And we know that there was no reaction for five hours, which is very strange. 
We also know that Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu withdrew some of his troops from the Gaza border to the West Bank. That is also on the record. We know that the, the, the boss of the Egyptian secret service, Kamil, General Kamil, had warned Netanyahu that an attack was coming. That's also on the record. Netanyahu says he never got, he never, you know, he never heard that. Oh, he didn't believe it. So I can't, I can't really tell you what, what Benjamin Netanyahu know, knew or what he did. I don't, I can't tell you yet. I know, I, I'm, I'm sure that Franklin Delano Roosevelt knew that the Japanese were coming and that he let it happen on purpose. And now with Israel, I don't know yet. But I think the, the, the Israeli themselves, they're going to investigate this because there were huge demonstrations against uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. And they, they want to know why, why, you know, for five hours, uh, Hamas uh, uh, fighters could slaughter Israeli citizens. There's a, there's a lot of Israelis who want to know that. And now we have the internet, you know, information moves much more quickly. There is no such debate <laughs> like we have here uh, after, in 1941. It's impossible. You know, the newspaper controlled the narrative and people had the newspaper. That was it. It took many years until we looked at it. And to conclude, I want to show this picture. For me, it's, um, it's, uh, it's just a sign that in the peace movements, we are many. I realized that that, that, uh, that picture is, uh, was taken many years ago, so don't have any gray hair at that. <laughs> That's just a reminder that we're, we're all getting older as time moves by. And um, I want to conclude by just paying my greatest respect again to David Ray Griffin, who has passed away, but he was uh, an outstanding, an outstanding scholar, an outstanding peace activist, a friend, a personal friend, um, a person from whom I've learned a lot. And um, I hope, you know, that this lecture that we have today um, reminds people of, of all the good that there is in human beings. There's a lot of good in us. We can, we can be brave. We can be honest. Yeah, uh, we can work for peace. So thank you very much for your patience and your interest in these topics. Thank you very much, Daniela. Um, it was a fantastic lecture. And I think you, you do it better than anyone else in terms of uh, laying out the, the depths of the strategic deceptions which have underpinned uh, Western belligerence for, for many decades now and, and do it with, with a kind of humanity and a compassion as well. So thank you very much for that. Now, we, we are going to go into a debate and a discussion, but we have fortunately resolved our technical problems and we have Professor Richard Falk back. Now, I, I briefly introduced him before. Uh, many of you will know Professor Richard Falk, um, eminent uh, legal professor, international law expert on Palestine. Um, I've worked with him on the OPCW whistleblower issue on the chemical weapons in Syria. And Richard was very close to David Ray Griffin, and we're going to have him say a few words about David before we go to the debate. Richard. Uh, thank you, Piers. I'm glad to be part of this event. Uh, I found the lecture by Danielle very fascinating and very compelling, and it, uh, I would say inspiring as to the nature of what underlies the outbreak of these wars that cannot be explained by the normal rationale of defending your country or defeating aggression, but represents something deeper, uh, especially in the uh, way in which the United States has behaved, particularly after the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, in uh, 1991. I want to begin by thanking uh, Elizabeth Woodworth and Piers 
Robinson and all the others who have planned and organized this event. It was my great pleasure and honor to participate uh, in this much needed effort to treat David Ray Griffin's legacy in the manner it so much deserved and yet was denied by the informal yet alarmingly effective ways that the media erase the memories of those who threaten the legitimacy of govern governing elites in fundamental and convincing ways. This was David's, oh, sorry, is this better? Uh, this was David's act, David's act of wrongdoing was principally in investigating for, uh, under the, uh, guiding, guiding light of a search for truth of the realities surrounding the 9-11 events. But, what turned out to be his his public wrongdoing was the supreme instance of his right doing. In other words, if we are at all genuine in our professed beliefs about citizen engagement as integral in, integral to a viable democracy, uh, we have to protect and honor those that are trying to unearth unpleasant but revealing truths. And 9-11 is probably the most unpleasant and yet most revealing truth of our time. And with the media so effectively pacified by corporatization and government interference, unrestricted scholarly in inquiry should not only be celebrated, but safeguarded as we are trying to do here today. I was invited to talk briefly about David's views of the impact of militarist approach to security fused with its post-Cold War ambitions to achieve and maintain global dominance for the United States. Part of David's motivation was an evolved sense of what it mean to be, what it meant to, what it should mean to be patriotic in the 21st century. And this reflected his wide ranging interests in ecology and his spiritual theological universalism. So that for David, patriotism of the nation or country needed to be reconciled on a profound level with a patriotism of the earth and a patriotism of humanity. We met in the early 1970s, after David read my 1972 book, This Endangered Planet, which uh, suggested to him our convergent interests and values. And accordingly, he invited me to a Santa Barbara conference being organized by a center that he then directed. At the time, David was preoccupied with the reconfiguration of postmodern thought beyond its European deconstructionist turn to shape an adaptation that he named reconstructive postmodernism that combined ecological uh, sensitivity with governance concerns on a global scale. After 9-11, he correctly, as few others of his stature did, the connection between 
safeguarding the earth and safeguarding the people of countries against the lies and deceptions of their own governments. David became attuned to the destructive directions of American foreign policy, which would not only bring great suffering to others, but would accelerate an American, an American dynamic of imperial decline. It was a dynamic I have called geopolitical hubris. And the theme of David's book completed while he lay dying in a San, Santa Barbara hospice with, had a timely title, America on the Brink, How U.S. Policy Led to the War in Ukraine. And I would mention that this act of while he knew he was dying in a matter of days and yet devoted what residual energy was left to him to finish this book suggests how deeply committed and maybe in this sense of believing that life didn't end with death, uh, deeply committed he was to exposing lies and telling the truth. He also rested part of his analysis on the myth of American exceptionalism, that the country does good in ways that uh, make it seem to be the essential nation or the what American Secretary of State called the indispensable nation. It's almost an inversion of the truth in the 21st century. It, if anything, it's the most dispensable nation on the planet from the point of view of the long-term well-being of the human species and of the interplay of uh, sovereign states. A very important aspect of this uh, rightward shift in American partisan uh, foreign policy arose from what became known as the unipolar moment that was a way of suggesting that the only geopolitical geopolit actor left on the stage after the Soviet implosion uh, was the United States and that it was possible to establish and necessary for the sake of American economic and geopolitical expansion to establish what amounted to a Monroe Doctrine for the world in which only the United States and NATO under the auspices of the United States would have exclusive responsibility for the management of peace and security, which meant the exclusion of China and Russia. And this is another way of looking at the importance of the Ukraine war. It was provoked, as has been suggested by Danielle, but it also represented a Russian attempt to challenge this unipolarity and to restore a sense of balance between geopolitical actors or superpowers, as they were known in the Cold War, and to defeat this effort of the United States and NATO to become the, guar the sole guardians of the way power is deployed and the way, uh, and the way, uh, peace and security are preserved. And so, uh, David's, uh, contributions go beyond exposing the 9-11, uh, truth, which is terribly important 
for discrediting the legitimacy of the governing uh, elites in this country, which constitute part of the deep state. And his extension of that understanding in these three books that uh, Elizabeth mentioned that deal with this effort of the U.S. to be more than a nation state protecting the West, but a nation state protecting the world. And while doing so, advancing its economic greed and the uh, suppression of tendencies that challenge this unipolar dominance. And so peace will only be achieved if balance is restored at this level of geopolitical interaction that allows China and Russia to play a part in the management beyond international law, beyond the UN, in keeping a measure of stability <clears throat> and a atmosphere of cooperation to deal with the common challenges facing the world at this time of which climate change is perhaps the most paramount and has been marginalized by this uh, other form of geopolitical uh, aggression. So I would end by saying this legacy of David Ray Griffin is something we should both cherish and make as public as possible because his blacklisting by the media and by the government is a alarming contrast to the uh, elaborate covering of the leading war criminal of our time, Henry Kissinger, who just died. And one can say, here is a warrior for peace who is blacklisted and his death is goes publicly unnoticed and, if anything, suppressed versus the most notorious war criminal whose death is a occasion for celebration by the media, by the New York Times, by the liberal elites, as well as by uh, conservatives. And so that contrast seems to me to be why it's so important that this center succeed in its work and that David and people like Graham McQueen receive the credit that they deserve and we need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, and now we'll bring everybody in and we will start the roundtable discussion. Um, I'll just check with Mike. Are we ready to go on this? Yes, we are. Excellent. Um, we have Richard. Yeah, Richard, can you just adjust your camera again, please? Thank you. Um, so here we have again, we have Daniela back, we have Marilyn, and we have Richard. Um, we've got a number of questions uh, from the audience, but we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I think the most important thing that strikes me is, I mean, there is this question of 9-11 truth and the significance of this and the significance of it at this point in time when, and this is really the question to you, is, is this point that are we now witnessing the beginning of the end of the, of the American empire? Um, we're seeing that the conflicts, whether it's in the Middle East or in the Ukraine, where the West seems to be coming up against a hard stop in some ways in terms of its ability to project military power. And so the question is, is the empire now beginning to come to an end? And if it is, how important in that process is 9-11 truth going to be in terms of, as it were, placing the final nail in the coffin? And, and I guess I'll put that first to Daniela, and then we can go to Richard. 
Um, thanks, Pierce. Obviously, a very important question. Uh, the Afghanistan war, which you know was was triggered by 9/11, uh, lasted for 20 years, from um, 2001 to 2021, and it was a defeat. That's something we don't even talk about, but it has to be reckoned. It's a defeat, and if if you have defeats piling up, uh, that's a sign of decline. The other defeat, I think, which should be mentioned, Obama uh, tried to overthrow. Uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Uh, you've covered that. Then Bashar al-Assad called Putin and told him to help him. Well, he asked him to help him. And so Putin came in and, and, and bombed the Islamic State, IS, which partly was, was you know, set up by the CIA in the Operation Timber Sycamore. But there, again, uh, it was a defeat. Syria was a defeat for the West in the sense that um, it was not possible to overthrow the Syrian government. And the third one now is Ukraine. The, the idea spread here in, in Switzerland and in Germany and in the UK and in the US and mainstream media was we will arm President Zelensky in the president of Ukraine and he will you know, crush the Russians. Now, the opposite seems to be the case. We, we're not at, at the point where we can say the Ukrainian war is over. But I see, if I look at Afghanistan, if I look at Syria, if I look at Ukraine, I see signs of defeat. And may I add one last thought? The idea to confiscate Russian, um, Russian mil uh, actually Russian bank accounts, you know, that's what happened. They, they said, we, we now confiscate, you know, Russian money, which is in London or in Zurich or in New York. We just confiscate it. And they did that, several billions. Um, that was a huge mistake because the Chinese and, uh, and, and the Russians and the Iranians and, and, and also the, the Saudis, you know, they've seen it. They've seen it. And they say, okay, they just confiscate your money. We should not trade in dollars anymore. We should, you know, have our own currencies and, and stay away from NATO countries. So, yes, all in all together, uh, these, are, these are times of, of decline for the U.S. empire. That can take a long time. But it, for me, these are signs of decline. Richard. Uh, yes, I uh, agree completely with what Daniele said. Uh, I would add that the decisive point of decline that should have been absorbed by the American foreign policy elite was the Vietnam War, where the U.S. had absolute control of every dimension of military superiority, yet lost the war, and interpreted that not as something that showed that the power of nationalism had a way of achieving a balancing effect in relation to military intervention in a post-colonial atmosphere, but that military power was losing its agency to, tr to control history. So it's more, uh, I would argue that it's more than uh, just the American decline. It's the decline of, a, of military agency. And yet, because the military is so uh, en entrenched in these deep state structures, it can't learn that. It's an unlearnable historical lesson that leads to one repetition after another and is sustained partly uh, by the arms industry, the merchants of death, that want wars, exaggerate threats, and keep the illusion alive that you are more secure as a society or a civilization if you're militarily more powerful. So I think that delusion about 
uh, the role of military power in the shaping of history is the most dangerous. It's more dangerous in a sense than the efforts of the U.S. to somehow uh, uh, neutralize this uh, in a, this process of decline by relying on military power, where the Chinese have risen to uh, a position of uh, extraordinary uh, influence and prosperity without military power. See, the contrast over the last, since 1980, let's say, between China's trajectory, which is an upward one, and the U.S. decline is really striking. And yet again, the American foreign policy elites, the think tanks in the, in the Washington Beltway, can't learn that lesson because of the interplay between the deep state and the private uh, economic structures that support militarism. And you see, at one final point, and you see it in relation to uh, Gaza also, where the Congress is almost unanimous in supporting this genocidal onslaught on Gaza, where the American public is favors a ceasefire by a uh, polls showing 76% of the people would favor that to the continuation of this Israeli attack. Yes, I, I, I get the sense very much of, a, of an, an out-of-control military-industrial complex. And, of course, it was Eisenhower who warned us of this originally. But, you know, the, the conflicts are becoming so extreme now. And as you say, the policy in relation to Gaza and Israel is so extreme that you know, it's not just a military hard stop, it feels, that, and there's also this sort of loss of ideational and also economic power on the part of the West. And I think what we're seeing in Gaza and Israel, and what we're seeing in terms of the global support for the Palestinians is, is really, you know, driving, hitting us below the waterline in the sense of Western credibility globally. Um, but I, I, I certainly do think, and I think, as you said, I mean, I think 9-11, because of the, 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 the nature of that crime and really the evidence that there is now this is this is really an opportunity with that issue to, to wake up you know what is left of western publics and elites to how badly wrong the west has gone in, in terms of this brutal militarism um marilyn did you want to come in here or, or did you want to come in a little bit later oh she's muted mike No, we can't hear you yet. Uh, you're muted at your end, Marilyn. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll come back to Marilyn in, in, in a little bit and when she's checked the computer. Um, or oh, is that you now, Marilyn? No. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to Marilyn in, in, in a few minutes. Um, I was going to sort of pose another question because... There's a lot of debate and conversation within, in a sense, the, the, the resistance community, um, whether that's resistance to the Western Empire or resistance in relation to other issues that we've seen. That there is this kind of idea that we're also confronting new power structures, the sort of global governance power structures. And of course, this has been picked up in relation to COVID-19. And there's a lot of people who both are very concerned about Western imperialism, are also very concerned about you know, the emergence of biosecurity regimes. And, and we see it in the pandemic preparedness agenda. We see it in the censorship industrial complex, as Matt Taibbi et al. have been describing. And that sort of it almost feels sometimes that we, we, we're bat we've been battling the US empire, but we also have these other structures which are imposing mm -hmm. upon populations and so on. And I wonder, I guess, linked to that, I mean, is if we're seeing the end of the Western Empire, are there also dangers of new 
um, these powers dominating us, whether it's, as it were, these global governance structures, which some people are concerned about, or perhaps even other superpowers emerging, China. Are we going to leap from one problem to another? Um, Daniela first, and then Richard. Um, yeah, obviously, there's there's a concern about the World Health Organization, uh, it, which is based in Switzerland. So um, I take that question. <laughs> uh, the the World Health Organization, as as for its track record, has said, you know, there's there's a pandemic uh, in 2020. In March 2020, um, we were all surprised here in Switzerland. I mean, I think everybody was surprised. I, I, if somebody had asked me in 2019. Uh, whether the World Health Organization has any significant power, I would, I would have said no. I mean, I, I said you know it's it's not it's not very powerful. And then in 2020, the way I saw it is that the World Health Organization has the ability to define a pandemic, and then all the governments seem to react in in accordance and and you know draw out the plan and say we're going to do a lockdown and you're going to wear masks and. You're going to have to to do a, a vaccination, and uh, I personally didn't do the vaccination because you know it's a personal decision. I think for everybody to 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 see the benefits and, and a cost benefit analysis, really, that's what you have to do. But we we went through through really difficult times in Switzerland in the year 2020 and 21, and uh, I think the same happened in the US with you know. People who got the vaccine, quarreling with people who didn't get the vaccine, and people who were um, in the lockdown and losing their business, quarreling with people who, who who made millions thanks to the lockdown, and like Pfizer made a lot of money. And um, so, I think we're still in the phase of we should look back to to these years. What happened? What, what was Corona? How did we react as a human society? And so, I, I see Piers, where where you're going. I see the yeah, the important debate what is the world health organization what what is their democratic le legitimacy how, how how on earth can they have so much power as something really to look at to but on the other hand i also think and that's on a positive note um we have an information revolution going on right now and that gives us much more uh, power i mean it's funny these little gadgets that we still struggle with like you know that that the marilyn doesn't uh, it cannot, you know, we can't hear her or that Richard, we can't see the video or so. But on, on the positive side, we are already in the middle of that information revolution. We're now in different countries, sitting together, communicating. Other people can watch us um, for free if they're interested. And, and that gives me a very positive feeling because I know the, the World Health Organization topic is, is, is none that can really cheer us up, like U.S. imperialism or China. That's not nothing to cheer up. But I hand over to Richard and be glad to hear his his thoughts about that. Richard, did uh, you want to, yes, well, Richard. Uh, ju just to uh, uh, add a footnote to what Daniel said about the World Health Organization, COVID. Uh, I think it also brought out the infusion of geopolitics into a health issue. I mean, one of the things that I've tried to stress in my writing is, the, is that the world order was designed after 1945 to give primacy uh, to geopolitics. There's no other explanation for giving the five most dangerous countries in the world a veto power which in effect was a message to the world that they didn't have to comply with the UN Charter if it ran against their strategic interests. And that was reinforced by the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials with crimes such as the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not subject to legal scrutiny, but only the losers' crimes were investigated. So that uh, law ceases to really be what we understand law to be in domestic societies if it's only applied to the weak and the strong are exempted from it. 
And it's that structure that we're living with. It was designed to be that way. It didn't just happen. And the other thing I think to keep in mind is that it's not only the uh, decline of uh, the American empire that's become, become relevant, but the rise of ways of resisting imperial power. And the BRICS are one expression of this, the uh, way in which China has used its uh, new uh, potency in world affairs, Russia's tr attempt to reestablish spheres of influence, and the Ch uh, Vietnamese capacity to show that a determined nationalist movement can outlast a superior military intervening force. All of these things are undermining the c capabilities of, of military power to, to control uh, political outcomes, but they're not undermining the reliance on military power. And so you had after the Vietnam War what was called the Vietnam Syndrome, which was interpreted to mean that the U.S. was inhibited from using its military capabilities because of this defeat, and that had to, there had to be new ways around that. And among those new ways, and this really bears directly on 9-11, is the pacification of the media. The, uh, the, the Vietnam War hawks who held out for the war were arguing that the war was not lost in Vietnam. It was lost in the living rooms of America. And by that they meant by the people that watched what the body bags come home and went into the streets and uh, applied sufficient pressure to bring them. So you found these uh, tactical adjustments that didn't recognize the real lesson of Vietnam, which against a mobilized national movement uh, can't overwhelm a superior, can overwhelm a superior military force. And I think that's so crucial to make that distinction uh, well known for the peace, for peace movement values. M Marilyn, are you with us now? Okay, can you hear <laughs> can me? You? We can hear you. You're very well. Wonderful, thank very you very clearly. much. Well, uh, Excellent, uh, fantastic lecture, Daniela, thank you. And Richard, thank you so much for your remarks and your many years of all your work, all the great work you do. I just wanted, was going to say about the U.S. empire, you know, um, about at the dawn of this century, Johann Galtung predicted that the U.S. empire would fall in around 2020. So we're a few years beyond that, but I, I see that this empire is definitely in decline. <laughs> and what he always, what he always used to say was, I hate the U.S. empire, but I love the U.S. republic. And so, you know, if the United States could just be one family among many in the world and cooperate with others instead of trying to dominate them. But the problem is, what would the U.S. republic look like? Um, we have to really uh, take charge of what, what that could look like. And in that sense, I'd like to just say a few words about, you know, some things people could do and how to address all the fear, et cetera. And I'd like to pick up on what Elizabeth Woodworth said in her introductory remarks about the concept of tumos, which she describes as the inability to tolerate injustice without taking action and which David Ray Griffin um, incorporated so clearly. You know, I think that there's tumos in all of us. And even though the imperial powers go to great lengths to suppress it in the general population and even assassinate leaders like Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. who embody it and spread it, they can't extinguish it entirely. 
So we have to recognize and rekindle it wherever we can. And I want to just give a couple of examples. You know, since Daniele is Swiss, let's recall the tumos of the founding Swiss fathers who gathered in 1291 in the forest clearing of Rutli, swearing a solemn oath to free themselves from the tyranny of the Habsburg Empire. And 500 years later, Friedrich Schiller beautifully and powerfully memorialized that story in Wilhelm Tell, the last play he wrote before his untimely and very suspicious death in 1805 following the French Revolution. Schiller was seen as subversive because his expression of tumos reminded people that empires are not invincible. And around that time, there was the Haitian Revolution. In 1791, we saw the Haitian Rutli, when enslaved people gathered in the forest of Bois Caiman, in what was then the north of what was then still called Saint-Domingue, uh, determined to free themselves from slavery and colonialism, and eventually ushering in the first free republic in the Western Hemisphere in 1804. But the imperial powers, including the United States, have been sabotaging the fulfillment of the Haitian Revolution ever since. The U.S. and its allies are currently propping up an illegitimate and repressive regime in Haiti. And, and this very small island nation has one of the largest U.S. empires in the world. I've been to Haiti several times since the 2004 U.S.-backed coup d'etat. And I've experienced the fierce determination of Haitian people to continue the fight for their freedom and dignity. You know, I'm often asked, why does the U.S. care about controlling this tiny little country of Haiti? I mean, sure, keeping Haitians poor and destitute ensures a steady supply of, of cheap labor for sweatshops. And Haiti actually does have uh, abundant uh, mineral and oil resources. but the real threat to the U.S. empire is the proliferation of tumos, the deeply ingrained spirited love of truth, justice, and freedom that Haitians tasted over 200 years ago and refused to give up. In fact, the Haitian Creole term for tumos is goûter sel, or tasting salt. You see, in Haitian mythology, zombies are the walking dead who've been manipulated into passive submission. But when you give them a taste of salt, they awaken to that deeper stirring of their truth and freedom-loving humanity. So, you know, I see Tumos and all of you on this panel. And Daniele, uh, you know, I'm a member of your German-speaking online community where you have expressed, ex essentially expressed Tumos in your core values of courage, truth, and love. And so to all of the viewers, I would say it's really important to recognize and nurture Tumos wherever you see it, fan that fire in your own belly and give those around you a taste of salt. Don't shy away from calling out the deceptions of 9-11 and so that we can together join with others to continue seeking truth, resisting tyranny. We have to alleviate suffering and end all wars. Uh, absolutely. It, it, it raises this question we, which we, we discussed before uh, about this idea of, you know, are the ins institutions which are established, whether it's United Nations, government structures, you know, are these so broken at this point in time that, you know, the only way we really can get out of this is through this kind of, you know, popular widespread mobilization, this widespread sort of adoption of Tunis and so on. Um, is it going to be people power? which makes the change, or, or perhaps do Richard or Danielle, do you see some hope in some of the organizations such as the UN being able to start to play a more constructive role? Daniela. Richard first. Oh, Richard. <laughs> okay. Is, is uh, it people power or, or, count, or are the institutions, I know you've been working closely on the United Nations with Hans von Sponik on, on a book. I mean, are these institutions really so broken now that it is just down to the people to, as it were, mobilize and push back? 
Uh, I think the, uh, the, the mobilization of people is crucial to make these institutions viable in ways that would contribute to the kind of world all of us here uh, want to see uh, evolve. Uh, but uh, the UN, as it is now, f continues to function, is a creature of this geopolitical primacy. And it can't, it can, it has a voice. The Secretary General, when he speaks now, and he's spoken quite well on Gaza, uh, that makes a difference in the terms of the general political atmosphere. But the UN can talk, but it can't act without the uh, in approval of the uh, veto powers. They block action. When they want to act, as in Libya in 2011, uh, they can do too much. In other words, if a, the UN consensus is war-minded, it can mobilize almost unlimited power. But when it's, when those, when the P5 are divided, at least as far as peace and security are concerned, it's helpless on the level of behavior. It's important on the level of symbolic level of values and ideas. So one shouldn't dismiss it, but at the same time, it's not a transformative agent at this point in time. Daniela, did you? I, I fully uh, agree with uh, what Richard says, that the United Nations Security Council is very often blocked by, uh, by the veto. I mean, if I look at the U.S. bombing of Iraq in 2003, you know, the, there was no criticism from the U.N. because, you know, the U.S. as a veto power could just veto it. Or when the Russian invaded Ukraine, you know, there is no way to 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 criticize that in the, in the Security Council because the Russians would just veto it. They couldn't pass a resolution. And when the British and the French um, bombed Egypt in '57, that was the same. So the veto powers really uh, really blocked the Security Council. So I'm fully I'm fully with Richard. And um, I also think what Marilyn said is is, is very important that we we need need to go to Tumus. We we need to. We need to find the courage in ourselves. And uh, to all the listeners that are out there, I, I think, Pierce, you're also one example of, of somebody who, who has this you know, courage and stands up and says, okay, this is how propaganda works. I'm going to explain it to you. And you, 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 know, you explained it in very clear-cut terms. And you and I know that then we are being criticized as scholars. And I think that's also something people need to understand that uh, scholars who expose propaganda or who expose how um, uh, deception works in, in the case of war, they, you know, they, they get a bad Wikipedia entry and they have all sorts of troubles. They get slandered in mainstream media. And I mean, David Ray Griffin had the same, you know, they just tried to silence him. But still, but still, it's important that we go that way, that we, you know, continue that road. And I think more and more people realize that this, this is probably the only way towards peace. It's not going to come from institutions high up there. It's going to come from us. It's going to come from the peace movement. I'm, I'm, I'm deep in my heart. I'm convinced that as a human family, we have the power. We have the power to, um, to, make, this, uh, to make this a better place. I mean, it's always the question, how long? You know, how long will it take? And I don't know. I don't know how long it takes, but I know we have the power. 
Yeah, smear smear campaigns and character assassination, as I keep on saying these days, are a part of propaganda tactics. And and when people realise yeah. that sort of when somebody's Wikipedia page entry is being vandalised, etc., it normally means that they're speaking the truth and so on. Yeah. Um, these are very yeah. standard tactics. You reveal them, then people sort of can learn and educate themselves, and then they can push back. Um, yeah, but this I mean, we, we've had a lot. A lot of questions. We've had a lot of questions coming in during this discussion, which is impossible for me to, to, to monitor. But, but we had a number coming in during the lecture um, with people asking about what it is that they can do, and so on. What can sort of the individual do? And and it does strike me, listening to all of you talking and, and also your lecture. You know, we have we, we live through this kind of weaponization of fear, the exploitation of fears. We had it during the Cold War. I remember very clearly the fear of you know, mutually assured destruction. Um, we've had it with 9-11, of course, and the construction of the Islamic fundamentalist threat. So people are scared of terrorism and, and now the virus with COVID, et cetera. But these are, this is a, these are powerful weapons that are used against people, against us and against members of the public. Um, and in a way, you know, from all of your what we've been discussing, if the institutions are going to need people support, then we need to give people ideas and ways of, you know, how do they cope with this onslaught of fear mongering? How do they find the courage within themselves to stand up and to mobilize? Um, so I, I guess in answer to this question, what would we all advise to, to, to people? What, what can people do? Is this the question of, you know, watching independent media rather than mainstream media? Is it a matter of getting out there, becoming active? What, what can people do who are listening, who recognize everything, who've seen the, the truths which Daniela has been describing and Marilyn and Richard as well? But what can they do on a practical level and, and what techniques can they um, yeah, adopt, I guess, in order to overcome the, the psyops element of the propaganda that, that, that is thrown at us on a daily basis. Um, I mean, perhaps, do, would you like to start on that, Marilyn? Or Marilyn? Sure, sure, no, I'll, yeah, I'll just say um, everything I said before about looking inside for that inner strength to do what is right, but also rec when you recognize other people, putting themselves out on a limb, defend them. Uh, spread the word about them. Don't don't just silently agree. If you agree with somebody, be very vocal about it and mm -hmm. raise up the David Ray Griffins of the world and the Daniela Ganzas and the Piers Robinsons and the Richard Falks and everyone else so that people really see that band together. I think when people join, you know, in person, locally, you really can, you know, def support each other in building movements. And, and I'll just give, you know, a little tiny example. Um, you remember perhaps on October 24th, my, my little city, 100,000 residents of Richmond, California, was the first city in the United States, uh, the city council passed a resolution um, calling for a ceasefire and an end to all of the, the, the killing of the, of the Gaza, people of Gaza in supporting the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of made headlines around the country. Where did that come from? It came from years of organizing. I've been part of local um, anti-imperialist organizing in my own community, which is, happens to be home to a major oil refinery. And we spent 20 years working locally to get a majority on our city council who recognized peace and justice as very important values. And they're not bought by, because so many politicians now are just bought and paid for by corporations, but we have a really a city council with integrity. And because of that buildup, it may be a little thing, but we adopted a resolution and now many other cities have. And the pressure is mounting on the United States to stop supporting this mass killing and ethnic cleansing that's happening in Palestine. So I say, look around, get together with others and support each other in your in building your movements. Hmm. Absolutely. If I may, um, the the things that I do is really that we should uh, follow values. Like I have my own values. I, I think truth is important, love is important, and courage is important. It's just three values. And I think if you ask what can anybody do, define your values. Define your values and, and don't make a list of 20 <laughs> values. It's enough if you have two or three or one if you want. 
And then whatever comes next, next day, next week, next month, next year, we're always being, you know, thrown, thrown challenges, many different challenges. Turn to your values and ask, what would love do? What would truth do? What would courage do? And if you do that, you have a very, very solid system to guide your steps. And you don't need CNN or Fox News or any, anybody else to tell you what to do. You can guide yourself with your inner wisdom. And, and uh, I've seen people getting very dissatisfied with Democrats or Republican or this party or that party. And, you know, they, they don't know whom to trust anymore. And I think place your trust in your own values. And that's what I've done many years ago. I've, I've said I put my trust in my values. And I, I cannot always, you know, live up to the maximum. You know, then I see, oh, the truth would say, now do this. And then I go like, oh, maybe I can't say that yet. You know, the audience isn't ready. I, I hold it back a little bit. But at least, I, at least I know the direction I have to go. So I don't go the wrong direction. I know where to go. And I just keep it a little, I, I walk slower. I don't, I don't dash forward. I take it slowly. And I think we all have that in ourselves. And then, as David said, recognize that you're going to die. And so try to die in, in, in a peaceful way. And what is dying in a peaceful way? I think being part of the peace movement is, is, is preparation for, for a fulfilling life. It is for me, because I have, I have friends who, who are already dead. They died from cancer, and nobody expected them to die at that age. So I... We all don't know. We just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Nobody of us knows, really. So the sec second thing is, I would advise people, don't postpone. You know, they we're great at postponing things. We're like, yeah, right. I'm gonna. Marilyn is right. I'm gonna speak up. I'm gonna post something that I like. David Ray Griffin. I'm gonna post that on my Facebook. Oh no, wait a moment. I'm not gonna post it tomorrow because if I post it tomorrow, some people will send me a dislike and. Maybe I'll do it in a year. It's not the right year. You know, they postpone all the time. I don't think it's time to postpone. And the third thing that I think is it's important to always stay away from violence because it's, it's such a dangerous thing, violence. It just sucks us in and people start killing each other on all sorts of pretexts. It's just the peace movement has to be very, very solid. Even when we're being provoked into violence, just to say no, we're not going to solve our problems with violence. So values, don't postpone, and stay away from violence. That's, that's what I suggest. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Richard. Uh, well, I agree with everything that's been very eloquently said so far. I would, uh, rather than only talk about the peace movement, I would... Uh, emphasize the establishment of community with like-minded mm. people. I think it's extremely mm. uh, mutually reinforcing. Uh, uh, and I've been part of some of these initiatives that are trying to create uh, globally global communities of uh, shared values. And I think that the time has come when that's not a, only a local, you know, what, what Marilyn refers to locally is extremely important because uh, politics in a way, uh, uh, emanates from the local. Uh, but we're, we're through the, the technology of, uh, the digital age, we are able to be in contact with people all over the planet and to to make that contact into a community one of the problems of the un is that there's no genuine uh, community each uh, member pursues its national interests in a rather short-term self-regarding way and what is missing is some sense of shared values that are not just rhetoric for annual speeches, but inform policies and inform behavior. The other uh, digitally enabled uh, 
uh, virtue of the age is this uh, access to uh, uh, online independent journalism, which does give you a way mm -hmm. of understanding how to read the New York Times. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to tell students during the Cold War, if you're living in the Soviet Union and are confronted by Pravda every day, you get, you, you learn quickly how to read it, to decode it in effect. But the New York Times is much more sinister because it's more sophisticated and, and you know, has this kind of contradictory uh, way of transmitting its biases and uh, supporting basically a war system. It did a lot to create the atmosphere for the Iraq war in uh, 2003. And it justified evading the UN in the uh, Kosovo war of 1999. So that the media has really been a, the mainstream media has really been an extension of the Pentagon in uh, many uh, crucial contexts. But we can go to uh, uh, online or online media like Counterpunch or Truth Out that are that publish really uh, incisive uh, scholarly essays that give you a, a, a better way of reading. One can put it that way. See, one of the difficulties, uh, Danielle, I, I welcome your. Uh, thoughts on this is that most of us can't spend our life uh, finding the truth because you have this overlay of propaganda and you don't know what to believe. Most people, even progressive kind of people, don't take stands on these very controversial issues because they they don't have confidence that they can access truth. And you do have to, David uh, is a good example. He worked, you know, 12 books are not easy to produce. And he he generated those through the commit. His commitment was to find out what really happened. He mm -hmm. didn't know at the beginning. You know, this first book, which I wrote the foreword for, uh, it was really a book of questions that, that uh, led him to have suspicions. But he had such a passion for truth that when those suspicions were not allayed, he went about uh, investigating as best he could what really happened on 9-11. But you can't expect everyone to do that. And... and uh, we need a division of labor, and that's why I think we need alternate sources of truth-telling and information that uh, we can rely upon. And I'd say just one last thing, and that is that the slandering of people uh, that comes from efforts to remove this layer of deception is less serious than what was done to David, which is listing. You know, trying to erase the memory. Uh, that, because if you insult someone, they can respond. But if you just erase them, there's no, uh, there's no echo. See, and most people, if they haven't been previously engaged, won't even understand the issue. So I think mm -hmm. it's very important that the, you know, I, I meant seriously this contrast between the treatment of Kissinger's death. If you're a mm -hmm. prominent enough war criminal, you'll get wonderful uh, obituaries. But if you're mm -hmm. exposing an inconvenient truth, you'll be blacklisted. And someone should do a contrast between the two, two deaths. Mm. 
It's, it's, we are in an era now with, with, with the internet and with independent media or alternative media where I think it is, you know, they have to resort to the smear campaign, but people can access the information, right, Daniela? People, you know, they can get hold of, you know, sufficient information. If they have the confidence, I think, that's a really important thing that we need to instill in people is to give them the, you know, the, both the critical thinking skills, but also the confidence in their own ability. But when they have that, they can go to the independent media. I mean, the last time I checked, mainstream media um, popularity was flatlining pretty much. Um, <laughs> you know, we are in this era where you know, this, this is an amazing resource um, for people. Uh, oh. could I jump? Could I jump in, Piers? Um, this seems, uh, Richard, you seem to be leading us to a little plug for our organization. I would say, if anybody is interested in learning more about nine eleven, or is just starting to question it and hadn't really thought about it much, just go to ic nine one one dot org, the website of the International Center for nine eleven Justice. It's an incredible repository of lots of different research, all the research of the nine eleven consensus panel, a number of both both scientific research papers as well as essays, commentaries, videos, talks. There's a whole variety of things. It's kind of a it's it's kind of a, a one stop shop starting point for getting information about that, and then it relates to other issues as well. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And also the, the other, as, as Elizabeth pointed out to us, I think before this talk, I mean, you know, platforms such as Twitter or X, as it's now called, all of these mediums do provide, you know, and they're not perfect, obviously, and they have problems um, and they are subject to manipulation, but they do provide these platforms where, you know, if people also recognize that you know, democracy is hard work and people have to engage. But, you know, those platforms are there and people can get engaged and they can educate themselves. And obviously, IC nine one one in relation not just to nine eleven, but the broader war on terror and all of the kind of structural deep events that we've been talking about. You know, there is an amazingly rich sort of range of resources out there for people who, you know, when they've got the confidence and they engage, they can find out. They can find out what's going on. And they can do something about it, and so on. So there's a lot out there. Sorry, did, do you want to come in, Daniela, on that? Sort? No, no. I think it's. I, I, I fully agree. It's important. And uh, if somebody is new to 9/11, I'm, I'm not sure whether anybody is new uh, to 9/11. I would always start with World Trade Center number seven. Just watch mm -hmm. how it falls. Watch how it falls, and then watch again how it falls, and then you know, go from there. Because it's sometimes for people it's hard if if if, if something is 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 a huge topic, you know, with a lot of data on it. It's hard. Where should I start? Then I think World Trade Center 7 is, is a very, very important start. Um, it, this has been a, a wonderful experience and we've had a wonderful conversation. Um, I, I, I did want to sort of bring this right down to kind of a, a personal level and, you know, and also link to this idea of, of what we're asking of people and what is demanded of people. Because, you know, we've been talking, you know, when you look at 9-11, when you look at the wars, when you realize what has been going on, this is heavy and depressing and it impacts people psychologically and so on. And I guess we all, you know, we all personally find our own ways of coping with that. But I was just wondering if, if we'd all, perhaps you could finish just by telling the viewers how you switch off from these heavy, weighty issues and re-engage. I, mean, I, I take the point you discussed about values, et cetera, earlier, Daniela, but there's also this switch off thing. You know, we are asking people to yeah. really, you know, peer behind the curtain and recognize how serious a problem that, or state we are now in. And that's tough. And it's tough on people with lives and families and jobs and, and so on. So what, any advice on, on the switch off uh, mechanisms? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we talked about this before, before we started that, um, that nature is actually of great help. So people who go out and, and walk, you know, they walk through nature, they go hiking or they swim in the sea or, if you have the chance to live at the ocean, go to the ocean, uh, or, or, or if you have the chance, go up into the mountains and, and, and do skiing or snowboarding. So to go out into nature, it really has a healing effect. I think the worst thing one can do is just to 
to be stuck in front of television and, and believe all the lies they're telling you. Uh, really, the opposite story is get out and and move because the body needs to be moved. I mean, all these emotions are in the body. They're, they're there. And if we're out in nature, you can see so many beautiful things. You know, if, 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 if you're stuck with the news, you get all the bad information about the world and you end up with a feeling that it's not a nice planet or that people are evil. But that's not true. I think it's a wonderful planet and human beings as, as a potential. We, we're wonderful. We're really wonderful. Look at all the good things that have happened. But um, media do a negative selection. You know, that's, that's what they do because, you know, Sex and crime sell, and that, that's why we get such a lot of bad news all the time. And we we need to manage that by by going out into nature. And as as Richard said as well, it's very important to find people that you can really share your thoughts with. I think communities are very important. Marilyn stressed this as well, and that's something I use. So I go out into nature a lot, and I have some very good friends with whom I can always talk about everything, be it Corona or 9-11 or, mm. or, or the Gaza Strip. You need, you need to have at least, you don't, you don't need 20 people. It's, it's enough if you have one or two. If you're lucky, you have five. But that, that you really talk with them on a, on a very truthful mm. level. I think that is very, very important. And if you have these two, there's no need to be, to be afraid. There's no, need, there's no need to be afraid at all. I mean, there have always been problems. And, and, and I personally think now with this information revolution, I mean, look at us. We're now based on different spots on the earth and we can, we can just share our thoughts. There's nobody who can censor us. I mean, this is important, okay? Nobody can censor this. This is just everybody speaks his mind freely and it doesn't go to an editorial board who will then cut out half of my lecture and cut out half of Marilyn's comments and said, what Richard said is good, but this part we're going to cut out. No, no, this is, this is uncensored. And this is 2023. So I think we, there's a lot, that's a lot about to be thankful for. I, I like the point about, you talked about friends, people to talk to, because I mean, we were talking about the internet and, and it's so important, the internet and the content and what we can do with it in terms of building knowledge, building communities, but that face-to-face local community thing, whether it's friends, family, you know, that's really, really important. And and I think that engagement Mm -hmm. people need to sort of really sort of strengthen as much as possible. That's a real world contact, et cetera, um, is, is essential. Um, Richard, do you you have any, we, we have mountains, which I I can, I can concur with that. It's mountains and sailing for me as well for getting away from it all. Richard, do you have a a, a favored sort of space, place recommendation on where to go to take time out from these issues? Well, I I was going to add for me personally, uh, sports have always been extremely important, uh, for both for friendship and for the uh, diversion from doing uh, more so-called more serious things. And I, it was for me a kind of, I uh, conceptualized it as uh, autotherapy. You know, I, I would play at, at lunch. Instead of having lunch, I would play tennis or squash ever, almost every day. And uh, that was, uh, it was a cleansing experience. It's not something for everyone, I guess, but it was a cleansing experience. And it built a a certain kind of community of people other than the people I interacted with uh, through my uh, faculty relations in the university. So uh, that's one thing. I I also think uh pr- uh uh one uh, uh, friendship is terribly important but also uh, a certain kind of enjoyable self-reliance is important Ch- playing chess for me has been a very important uh, aspect of why i think i've enjoyed my life, even though I've been frequently, I was a special rapporteur on Palestine for the UN, and I was fr- frequently attacked as an anti-Semite and uh, all sorts of unpleasant things, but it never really phased my 
existential experience of life or my commitments because I had enough to fall back upon mm. Mm. other than that. I, I, I've heard you're a demon table tennis player from somebody. Is that true? I was. I was. I was. I won't. But, I won't say uh, who told me that, but you can probably guess. <laughs> oh, that's okay. it. Yes, because <laughs> he he thought he was till he met um, me. Ah, okay. <laughs> <This is Matt. laughs> Marilyn. Yeah, yeah. In terms of uh, finding respite from all the negativity that's out there, the 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 deceptions, the violence, the repressions, and everything. I'm, I'm going to. Go, go for two basic things. One is just plain human connections. I always try to, I always try to come from a place of love. You know, I'm, I'm a mother and a grandmother and I just really value other people. And so, yes, definitely I connect with those close friends that I can talk openly with about everything, as Daniela says, mm -hmm. but just other people too. There are people who I know I don't agree with on a lot of things, but they're still beautiful human beings, and I can value time spent with them um, doing different things, whether it's family, friends, neighbors, etc. And then the other thing is, uh, as Daniela mentioned and, and Richard alluded to with his sports, is being out in nature. For, for me, um, I, I like to hike a lot in the Northern California woods and forests and hills and mountains and shoreline. And to me, that's just the best uh, way to promote my, you know, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. So remember Mother Nature and appreciate her and give her gratitude and go hug a tree. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, well, thank you, all of you. Thank you, Richard, uh, Daniela, Marilyn. Um, and Elizabeth um, for um, an excellent discussion and I think a, a fitting tribute to David Ray Griffin um, with the annual lecture established today. And thank you to everyone who's been emailing. I know we haven't been able to answer any of the questions, um, but thank you for viewing. And um, finally, check out IC911 website and all the work that we're doing. Um, I'm sure you'll find it very useful and important. And thank you very much for watching.